Hello, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well wherever you are. Well, wishing you all the best, but we hope you can join us and stay with us uh, to the end of this discussion we're going to have today. Today, you wouldn't want to miss this discussion. I'm hanging out with a very lovely sister. And sometimes you, you see people over there and you, you, you don't even imagine if something is going on with them or they're experiencing something. And that is what's usually dyslexia, dyspraxia, and all the related learning difficulties is about because you can't tell uh, from looking at somebody how bubbly, confident, smart they are. You can look at a person and just imagine that they have some sort of difficulties. So today I am excited to hang out with a very great person. As usual, my name is Rosalie Abigail Trenate and I bring you the series of Dyslexia Global Conversation. As part of the Dyslexia Awareness Month, there is a whole lot of activities that we have been doing. However, we have not also stopped doing Dyslexia Global Conversations. And on Friday, and Saturday, we have the upcoming training. If you have not signed up yet, you're missing out. Please make sure to sign up and be part of the training. Um, you wouldn't want to miss it. So let's go back to who I am hanging out with today. I'm hanging out with Miss Eva New Love, uh, who is a woman of many, many talents with a professional background in project management, Eva is first and foremost a social entrepreneur, passionate about supporting the well-being of men and women in every area of their lives through her motivational networking society. I mean, just the little bit I've given you tells you who the person is, right? She is a TV host and also a plus-size model and a champion to put confidence and in plus size women. And so I'm hanging out with her. She is dyslexic. She is also, she has also dyspraxia. And we're going to listen to her and learn something from her. So share this with all your friends, invite people to join the conversation, ask questions. And whilst the end of the program, we will be asking Miss Eva the questions that you are submitting. So without much ado, I will welcome Miss Eva to the Dyslexia Global Conversation. Hello. Hello. Hi. Welcome, Miss Eva. How Thank are you, you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I'm good, I'm good. I'm really good, I'm well. I'm excited I... to hang out with you. I'm very fine and I'm excited yeah. to hang out with you. At the same time, like, you're so confident and I'm like, oh my goodness, today, how am I going to handle myself? <laughs> Everything goes. I'm, I'm not that confident. <laughs> I'm not that confident, but yeah. You, you are it's though. Part That's of what I do. So I know how to act confident. <laughs> right. If I'm confident. Yeah. But I'm very so, happy. Yeah, thank you for inviting me on Africa, um, you know, dyslexic organization platform thank you so much it's my yeah. pleasure i give a brief summary of who you really are normally mm -hmm. i like people to tell us what they are doing who they are tell us a little bit about yourself okay so right now i'm i'm a tv host i have a show called goal diggers goal diggers like football goal not gold, because people always say gold diggers. <laughs> no, gold diggers. Yeah, I have a show called Gold Diggers, which is about bringing to light people that are doing great things in their communities, professions, and various societies. Um, the focus of the show is mainly on entrepreneurship. So most of my guests um, are, you know, at the beginning of their startup entrepreneurial journey or halfway through or at a very good stage of their journey and um this show is on omega live tv which is an online tv station which is on facebook and youtube 
and it's also on Sky TV, which is like the digital, the biggest digital um, TV network in the UK, Sky Channel 7. Yeah, Sky Channel 7. So, yeah, that's what I do right now. I also do plus size. I'm also a plus size model. I um, joined an agency in Ghana called the Plus Size Model Agency. Um, I actually do more work in Ghana than I do here in terms of the plus size modeling and advocacy. Um, I come to Ghana about three times a year. I've been doing that for about three years. So yeah, that's what I do now. Like you mentioned, I have um, a professional background in PR and project management. So I also do that as well. Um, so most of the things I do are interrelated because I do PR, you know, it, it's I don't have to look for a PR agent to help me, you know, find my guests or, you know, just I'm really, I have a gift when it comes to networking and socializing. I would say, yeah. And also um, I have an organization called the New Love Experience, which is a motivational networking society, which is what I started before going into TV presenting and modeling. I started that about three and a half years ago when I finished university. And um, I did that because I wanted to, like I, I've always had a good network because I have a background in PR, as I said. So I wanted to um, bring people together from different industry sectors to network, you know, come together. So I started that after uni. And um, with that, I'm sponsored by Barclays. So I always have my events in partnership with Barclays. Thanks. So yeah, that's what I do. That's me. I'll, wow. go I'll go deeper into everything as we go along in the conversation exactly yeah. like you are doing so so well and of course this show is about dyslexia and highlighting the related learning difficulties and so everybody that comes on this show have a thing to do with any of those and I okay. have had experts here who are like people working in the field of dyslexia i've had people okay. here who are actually dyslexia can you tell us how growing up was like growing up was quite difficult for me because i didn't i wasn't diagnosed with dyslexia until i was 30. so as a child oh um yeah I wasn't this I wasn't diagnosed till I was 30. So growing up as a child for me was really a struggle because I I was always um slow in class, didn't understand things. I was more into the creative side of learning, which is like the arts, you know, art, drama, acting, well drama is acting. Um just the creative side, design technology. I was quite good at science though because science is quite practical. So I was good at practical things because I'm a practical learner. But when it came to maths, English, I always, you know, had a lot of issues, especially with maths. I used to hate maths. I never understood maths when I was young, even times tables. It's like I'd learn and learn and learn and learn and I still wouldn't get it. Had very, had a very, had a very bad memory. I had problems with my speech like my articulation um yeah so I was always kind of how can I say really I mean I was I was quite confident but I was always I had low self-esteem as well when it came to anything academic so when I was in school I always had you know a lot of low self-esteem and I just I didn't enjoy school you know I just enjoyed the friendships and like I said, the creative side. So I also enjoy PE, which is physical education. So anything that was not to do with focusing on, you know, the core subjects, which are maths, English, science, um, yeah, history, anything where I had to concentrate was really hard for me because I have very bad concentration as well. I can't like sit down for like, well, I can now because I've you know, I've learned to, but as a child, it was really difficult for me to sit in one place 
and focus on something. And I used to fall asleep a lot when I was reading or watching films, you know, anything where I had to concentrate, I just couldn't. So yeah, my childhood in terms of learning was, you know, it was a headache for, especially for my mum, you know, and when I went into secondary school, I think, um, because it was so hard for me, I started like missing classes, especially maths. I used to like miss my maths classes and not go to school, stuff like that, because I just couldn't explain to anybody that I didn't understand, you know. It's not that I didn't want to learn, I just didn't understand anything. So, and I could read and write because I have dyspraxia, so we'll go into that, but. I could read and write, so nobody believed me, would would have believed me at that time if I said, I don't understand. And even sometimes I did say I didn't understand, but, you know, back in the 90s, going to school and the 80s, let's say late 80s and 90s, you know, dyslexia wasn't even, a, it wasn't really that big or, you know, some, it wasn't something that was kind of recognised a lot. So you were just deemed the bad child that didn't want to study or was disruptive in class. So once I left school, I, I started beauty therapy. I went straight into, I, like, I didn't even do A-levels. I wanted to do A-levels, but I just didn't get good enough results, GCSE results. I don't know what you call them in Ghana. Um, the, the, the exams you take when you're finishing secondary school before you go to sixth form. the high school certificate as a nation I think yeah, that's what that, yeah. I so when I left school I, I studied beauty therapy because it was a practical you know I was good with doing makeup and you know all that stuff so I, I went I, I left school and went straight to do beauty therapy I just didn't even though I wanted I always wanted to be a lawyer like you know I had that dream of being a lawyer studying law but it just could never happen because at that time I just I didn't have the confidence oh. let me ask you this at, so at what age did you start reading and writing um I started when you like always mm -hmm. I was always good at reading I never had a problem with reading that's the thing because um I was good at writing, I had good handwriting, you know, and I could read. So to, to say that I was dyslexic at that time, like I said, in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, I don't think they would have, at that time, dyslexia was like people who didn't read, couldn't read or couldn't write, you know, or, or just couldn't add maths and numbers together. And I could do those things. So you know, um, I never had an issue with reading and writing. So then, uh, what did they diagnose at the age of 30? Was it dyspraxia? Yeah, I was, I was diagnosed with dyslexia first because when I was in my 20s, um, where I worked, a work colleague of mine said to me, I think you're dyslexic because I, I think it started to appear as I got older because I would put words back to front or I would do double words like and and in my sentences my emails there was a lot of spelling mistakes but um yeah it's just like I couldn't structure sentences well you know I could write but it's just like if you if you were to read something that I I had written sometimes it wouldn't make sense if that made if that if if you get what I'm saying like it just wouldn't make sense so someone pointed it out to me that I could have dyslexia when I was about 25 and I was like I don't think I'm dyslexic I just I didn't even want to hear that to be honest um but I was diagnosed at 30 because I, I decided that I wanted to go to university and when I went to university and I, I went to apply they was like, where, where's your, they ask you for like your GCSEs, your A-levels, which, which you guys called O-levels, I think. And, and I said, I don't have those qualifications. And they were like, why? And I was like, because I never did um, A-levels, but I did beauty therapy, I did performing arts. And, you know, it just, the, the, the qualifications I had were not enough 
to go to university. So they asked me to take a test, like an English test, a maths test, and a reading test. And then when I did that, um, they said to me, it seems like you have traits of dyslexia. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, well, if they're telling me I have dyslexia, I have. And they said, I need to have a real, like, I need to have a real assessment done before they can accept me into the university because it's going to be very hard for me to do a degree with dyslexia I'm gonna you know I would never be able to finish the degree so I I um done some research and I found the educational psychologist online who does assessments for children and adults because you know a lot of a lot of um people like psychologists they just focus on children and a lot of people weren't focusing on adults at this this was like about eight years ago so I found the guy who you know focused on doing assessments for adults and I, I I paid money and I got an assessment done which took three days it was a three-day assessment and by the second day I was in tears I had a breakdown by the second day because I just couldn't concentrate on what he was trying to do with me and then that's when we realized that I have a problem because I just couldn't focus on the test, you know, because there was, you know, dyslexia tests are like a series of tests. They test a lot of different things. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's how I got diagnosed at the age of 30, believe it or not. So. I believe you. I mm -hmm. absolutely believe you because for me it was almost the same age. I was 30 okay. um, when I got diagnosed and it was a horrible experience. Like really going through this assessment brought a lot mm -hmm. of emotion. I cried. I have done the assessment twice and I cried. Yeah, in so all. I. I'll tell <laughs> you about the second time. But yeah, yeah the first the, the first time, like I said, was really, um, it, it put a lot of puzzles together because it took me back to my childhood and it took me back to a se like series of events why I couldn't focus on anything academic, you know, why I just couldn't understand maths. Like you could explain something to me like 20 times, 30 times, and I still wouldn't get it. You know, so I used to really annoy people and teachers because they would explain something to me and I still wouldn't get it. I'd wait for everyone to leave the classroom and I'd go back to the teacher and say, I didn't understand what you, you know, can you explain it to me again? You know. So, yeah, it, it took me back into my childhood and made me realise why I had such low self-esteem when it came to anything to do with studying, school, you know, and why I focus more on, you know, enjoying my life <laughs> and, you know, not focusing on what's important in life because I just didn't understand certain things. I just couldn't get things like, you know, even learning how to drive was, it's, you know. So, yeah, wow. so when I took, so when I took that test, um, they diagnosed me with dyslexia and you know the reports, my reports like this thick, like 45 pages. I, to be honest, I've never gone through it myself, the whole 45 pages. So once you get diagnosed, then the university um, puts things in place for you. So like I had more time to do exams. I had longer time to hand in my coursework. Um, some some modules if you get like a low percentage you get compensated you know like no a normal person if they they score below 50 percent they have to redo a a module but if you have dyslexia they sometimes they compensate you so you don't have to redo modules and then also there was certain um things they would put on my laptop but because i didn't have that problem with reading and writing they weren't really good for, like, I didn't really use them as much because mine was bad memory. So I used my voice recorder a lot in lectures. So I'd record all my lectures. And then when I was driving back home or when I was at home, I will listen to the lectures back again over and over and over again, you know, to remember what was said in a lecture. So 
that's how I went through university. And then when I went, when I left uni, I got a job and they didn't believe I had dyslexia, even though I gave them the report and they had to send me to do another test. They said that they're going to pay to send me somewhere to get another test done. And when I went and got that test done, that's when I was diagnosed with dyslexia. And the lady was like, you have, so I was diagnosed with dyspraxia. I'd never heard of it in my life. And then she said to me, you know what? You actually have dyspraxia. It's not dyslexia that you have. And then she broke down to me different forms, different types of dyslexia and, and said to me, this is why, you know, you even though you were diagnosed with dyslexia, there was still a lot of, you still didn't understand why, you know, you are the way you are. And this is why, because you have dyspraxia. So dyspraxia is about, is to do with your coordination and your memory and your articulation and um then it, then it really made sense to me like you know the the problem that i have because even though i was diagnosed with dyslexia i still felt like but you know i'm still different from other dyslexic people you know so you yeah. know um, when you said you been recording your your lectures and re-listening to them and all everything. I'm like, that's my twin over there. I was recording all lessons because they were speaking fast most of the time and I wasn't getting it. So I resulted in recording almost all the lectures that I go, um, I attended. And uh, also I still believe there is a probability that there is a form of dyslexia you have because also uh, there is what we call the co comorbidity. So what that means okay. is I can have dyslexia, but I could also have dyscalculia and dyspraxia at the same time. Same time, and, yeah. yeah. Same time. So it could be possible that, yes, um, you have that. It might not be severe. I have very severe dyslexia. But you may have the very, like, mild type because you were able to read and write um also maybe yeah that's what books. i was told mm -hmm. yeah so yeah, that I, I was told that i do have dyslexia but it's mild but my dyspraxia is is, is stronger like is higher than the dyslexia does that make sense yes yes i totally yeah. agree with that so can you tell our viewers to kind of understand what are your daily struggle as someone who has dyspraxia and also a mild uh, version of dyslexia? Okay. I have very bad memory. So you can tell me to do something and within five minutes I've forgotten. Or I could be talking to someone on the phone and I could, comp I could forget completely what we're talking about. Like my memory just goes blank and I've just forgotten what we were discussing, or I'd have to say to the person, can you say that back to me? What did you say again? I didn't get what you said. And that is a constant thing. That's a daily thing. Like I said, bad memory. Um, articulation as well. Like, in my mind, I know what I want to say. I know how I want to say something. But then when it comes to saying it, I can't, you know, like even now it's like I can't speak the way I visualize or how it comes in my mind it doesn't come out like that do you understand so that's another thing I, I battle with daily also organization organizational skills really bad like I'm very <laughs> I feel like I'm selling myself in such a bad way but I'm just being honest isn't it so in terms of organization really bad like no matter how much, even though I have like a planner on my phone, reminders, a diary, you know, it's like I still forget things. Like something can, a reminder can come up on my phone. If I don't act on it immediately, I'm going to forget. If I don't put it on snooze to remind me 10 minutes later, I'm going to forget. So, um, and then also, um, not something I battle with daily, but one of my biggest struggles is balancing. So I, I, I never learned how to ride a bike, um, any sport like roller skating, ice skating, anything to do with balancing, I cannot do. It's just, 
I've never been able to do those things because I it's like it's very even if I go high up it's like a form of vertigo but it isn't vertigo so even if I go to a football match or a sports something I can't go really high up you know one time I went to a football match and I was holding on to the side that like I was struggling because I couldn't balance like I didn't even know where to put my feet you know and these are the things that people think is that really part of this dyslexia but yeah it's part of this dyspraxia definitely so these are the kind of things I struggle with it, it's more it's it's a it's a, a neurological thing so it's all in the brain so I can um you know it's like even pronouncing words and stuff like you know pronouncing words I get my words mixed up and no matter how many how many times you tell me I will still get my words mixed up I think the more people tell me that I'm saying the wrong thing the more I do it so you know like when you when you let me know that I'm speaking the wrong way then it makes me even more anxious and then I start to stutter so yeah, these are the things that I deal with on a daily basis. And, you know, like it's something I've been dealing with through my childhood. Like I said, I just didn't understand what was wrong with me. Sometimes I used to think, you know, what's wrong with me? Why am I like the way I am? You know, and that's what brought in the self, you know, low self-esteem and the depression, you know, because I just couldn't understand why I'm the way that I am. And it affects your relationships. It affects friendships. You know, it affects everything around you because people can see when you like you don't believe in yourself or you don't have confidence within yourself. And it, it affects you when you go for job interviews. It affects you when you're doing public speaking, you know, just everything. So that these are the things that I deal with on a daily, you know, daily basis, I'd say. And just like mm -hmm. writing emails, like I, I struggle to write emails, you know, like. It, it's not that I struggle to put sentences together. That's not, it's it's the time. You know, just a simple email can take me about an hour to write where it takes someone five minutes because I'll read over my email like so many times. And the more I read over it, then the more I get confused. So that's how it was for me at university. Like I could be on an assignment for like just a chapter for like a week. Whereas somebody could have done a whole assignment within two days. So it's the time that I take to do things. It's like I'm extremely slow when it comes mm. to putting things together. But what, when I get it together, it's amazing. But it just takes such a long time to get together. But then the positive thing of being dyslexic and being dyspraxic is that, you know, we're geniuses and we have superpowers in other areas. So... When it comes to other things, you know, I work so fast and at such just great speed, it's hard for people to believe that I even have dyspraxia, you know. And I think yeah. maybe that's why I do so well in PR. Yeah. So I I, I, I just ha I even have that question for you, like what is your natural superpower? But before we get there, you know, a lot of people. I mean, uh, m most of my audience are uh, Ghanaians and in other African countries. Don't even think dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia is, is anything that can really trouble somebody. And I want to find out from you, as but you did grow up in England. But uh, as growing up, were you picked on by your teachers? Were you picked on by your parents, friends? How did your friends cope with like all your challenges? Yeah, um, when when it comes to our community, like the Ghanaian community, it's, you know, like my mum, even up to this day, I don't think she even believes or understands what dyslexia is. I think she just thinks, you know, a lot of my Ghanaian friends will say, why do you label yourself like that? Why do you say that you have dyslexia? Because you don't have dyslexia, you know, stop saying it. It's like, you know, speaking something on, it's like putting a curse on yourself or you have this, you have this. And I'm like, no, I do have it. It's very hard to explain to people, especially Ghanaians and in Ghana that I have dyslexia. They just don't get it. Um, when I was young, I was picked on a lot, especially by my own 
family, I would say, you know, especially my mom, she'll say, you're slow. Oh, would you, we are slow, pa. Or why are you not, hurry up, you know, why are you doing this thing so slow? Because I was so slow at everything. And even because I'm a big girl, she used to think, oh, it's because of my weight. You know, it's like she just didn't think it was because I had dyslexia or any learning difficulty. She just thought, oh, maybe I'm a big girl, I'm lazy. But it wasn't even that, you know. So, yeah, as a child, it was really, it was difficult, especially in the community, like my cousins, everybody was fast and, you know, doing, getting on with things. And I was just always slow. I didn't understand things. And I couldn't say when I didn't understand something, if my mum was to, even speaking she is so difficult for me, even up to this day. And people think I don't want to speak she because I like being British, you know. But it's not that. It's I find it very hard to pronounce the words, and I understand it fluently. You know, I understand. It's funny because I understand she and fancy like fluent, but I can't speak. I can't speak it because I just cannot pronounce the words fast enough. You know, there's a way that it's supposed to. You know, our words. There's a way it's supposed to roll off the tongue, and I can't. I no matter how much I try, I just cannot. And it's not about the fact that I'm like I have an English accent it's I, I find I just cannot pronounce words in other languages like any other language you know so that's one of the biggest barriers I think when it comes to being Ghanaian in our culture is just explaining to people why I can't speak tree and they just don't understand like no but how can you not how can you not speak your own language they just don't get it but I really struggle you know because who, why wouldn't I want to speak Chi, you know? Why wouldn't I? Of course I'd love to. I'd love to be in Ghana and be able to speak in my, my own language and not speak English, but I find it very difficult. So I've just made the choice not to even bother and just speak English. Because at the end of the day, there's people in Ghana that are, you know, not Ghanaian and living there speaking English. So I yeah. got to a point where I said, you know, I'm not going to kill myself anymore. I'm just going to get on with it. Yeah. I think they, but they, yeah, they, be, being young was it was difficult amongst Ghanaians a lot because they just used to think I was slow or clumsy, you know. Like like I said, you know, dyspraxia is a form of it's also clumsy being a clumsy person. Person when you read when you Google it, you know, the word clumsy comes under dyspraxia, and being clumsy is like you know, like like tripping you know like falling over like because I can't even see where I'm walking you know in terms of my footsteps or bumping into things as I'm walking you know yeah and sometimes confusing left to right and all that I'm sure you you experience that I that, do sometimes, yeah. sometimes oh take a left. lot I really mean you to take right. And people don't understand some of yeah, these. Yeah, when people, people say, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so people, they normally don't understand the challenges of uh, people with learning difficulties and other form of difficulties go through. And the funny thing I keep saying to people is, for physical disabilities, of obviously you will see it on a person. But when it comes to the hidden disabilities such as dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, and all the rest, there are some things you can't see. But it it causes a lot of damage. It causes a lot of harm to us. And I understand mm. you because it is this daily struggle that I went through to be where I am today. And I still go through these challenges all the time therefore i do understand you and but then somebody like your parents and staff will still say that no don't put that word dyslexia the word is so heavy that people feel like it's it's it, a disease an illness or something and they don't want to be associated with it but hopefully with some of these dialogues we have people will have a mindset change and they will know that oh there are people who actually go through daily struggle because of this and for the viewers i have to let you know it is not something that some, you can grow out of it it stays with mm -mm. you forever however you learn it, it, 
it gets worse yes and you have to learn to manage it if you don't learn to manage it your life will be so miserable and that is the conversation we are having today so if you just tune in i am hanging out with miss uh, new love uh, she is a person with dyslexia, dyscalculia, and also dyspraxia. She is sharing her life story of growing up as somebody who was facing all these challenges when it comes to academic work, but until age 30, that she found out that she has dyslexia and dyspraxia and all the related co-mobility ones. So we are hanging out with her. If you have some specific questions, please send them to our chat and I will ask Ms. Eva. Eva, what do you think really happened that affected your, your self-confidence? Because I've had conversation with you and you keep, and even on this platform, you keep saying that it affected my confidence. It's really, really, and it's something you are working on. What do you think happened for you to get to that stage? And what are you doing to get yourself out? Um, I think my biggest issue that the biggest thing that affects my confidence is like I said my memory like not remembering things like you know just going to a simple event maybe learning about property or finance and then you know leaving thinking I, d I didn't remember anything that was spoken about and even it's very hard for me to write notes as well when I'm at an event or you know I've learned to do that now but you know, a few years ago, I wasn't doing things like that. So it's like, just anywhere I go, and if I want to learn something new, it's very difficult for me. Very, very difficult for me. So um, what I do now is that I always record things. I always take notes when I go to events, when I go somewhere to, you know, just to learn a new skill. You know, that's my biggest challenge even now is learning new skills because we all want to learn as we're get learning new skills is not for children only it's for us even like finding new jobs you want to better your skills you know um, just personal things like even being a presenter you want to better your skills you want to you know better your present the way you present on tv and um, being a model as well like we were talking about the left and right sometimes i'll be on a shoe and the photographer was the photographer will say to me you know like move to your left and I will move to my right and then he will say okay go forward and I'll be like how do you want me to go forward you know just things like that that another model will just be like okay left right pose you know for me it takes a long time because like I said my my just to tell me to go forward or back then I get confused I get so confused just little directions you know, so it's just like I always let people know now whether they know about dyslexia, dyspraxia, whether they don't know. I tell them, listen, I have dyslexia, so I'm quite slow. I'm like, this. and some people just laugh. They're like, whatever, you know. And I'm like, no, seriously, I have dyslexia, so I'm really slow. Like when you're when you're speaking to me, you almost have to speak like you're speaking to a child, you know, so that I understand, you know. And if I say to you, I don't understand, can you please repeat that? Can you repeat that? Like, I'm not afraid to say, you know, can you repeat that to me, please? You know, so that's the kind of things that I do now as before. I, I was scared to do those things because I was always thinking people are going to laugh at me. You know, I'm a grown woman. I'm a mother. I should know better. You know, even when I go to the bank, even to read my bank statements, like, you know, now we do online banking. And even the other day, I was looking at my, my bank transactions and I didn't understand. I was like, I don't understand this. Like, you know, when your, your account is in credit or in debit, you know, has been debited, stuff like that. I just don't understand those things. So I asked the bank and I asked somebody, can you show me this, that, whatever? I'm not afraid to ask people when I don't know something. Even at age, I ask. I'm always asking. Because if I don't ask, I'm not going to know because nobody's going to tell me. So I ask every little detail now, everything. You know, and even at work with my work colleagues and stuff like that, I ask them because they know that I have this thing. I, I, dec I, dec I did declare at my interview that I had dyslexia before they offered me the job. 
So they offered me the job knowing that I have dyslexia. So in the workplace, I'm not afraid to, you know, ask people when I don't know what to do. Or when I've forgotten, I wouldn't say I don't know what to do, is when I just, I've forgotten and I need to be told again how to do something. But like, we were talking about superpowers before. I'm, I'm a very good practical learner. If you know me how to do something, if you sit with me and show me how to do something, I learn it immediately and I can do it. But if I'm like on a Zoom conference like this, or I do an online call, it's going to be very difficult for me to learn. I'm more of a classroom person. I'm, I have to go to lectures. You know, it's like I have to physically learn something like, you know, like how kids learn with um, toys and, you know, things like that. That's how I learn. When it comes to practical things, I learn like I'm really good at doing hair. I'm really good at doing makeup. I'm really good at stitching clothes. You know, I'm really good at things like that. But I just... I didn't go and do those things because I wanted to challenge myself to do the things that I've always, I always thought I couldn't do. Because when it comes to those things, I could have even had a shop where I sew clothes. I could be a seamstress, you know, I could be a hairdresser. I could be a beauty therapist, which I studied when I left school. But, you know, I'm so ambitious. There's so many things that I wanted to do. You know, so that's why I'm now I use myself in, as an example that you can do anything you want to do at any age because I'm nearly 40. But I'm doing the things that when I was a little girl, I used to dream of doing, you know, when you're young and you dream to you want to be an actress, you want to be a superstar, you want to be this. Those are the things that I'm doing now to give other people hope, not just people with dyslexia, but my thing is more about self-development and comfort, self-esteem. Because people have different reasons why they have low self-esteem. It could be from having a learning difficulty. It could be from a trauma or anything that they've gone through in the past. You know, because uh, alongside the dyslexia, I've been through a lot of other things as well. But we're, we're talking about dyslexia, so that's what I'll focus on. But, yeah, so I think I've gone off track. <laughs> No, you are you are good. I mean, uh, this is to give also our audience the practicality or the real, real issues of we people that have this learning challenges. Usually you're talking about it and people don't know. Um, they just imagine, okay, yeah, I hear it's a learning difficulty and all that. But like somebody like you who is living with it, somebody like me who is living with it. We need to share some of these challenges. We need to share the stories so that people can get yeah. it. For instance, I'm organizing this uh, training on Friday and Saturday, and we have a lot of people who have signed up for the, the, the training. It's also really nice to know that people want to learn about it, but this is where experts are going to tell them what to do. But I think one thing that is okay. lacking that I didn't put in that training was having somebody like you or myself on to really share also to the audience, like this is how if you are a teacher and you are not teaching a child very well in school mm -hmm. and you are picking up on them, this is the damage you are causing to the child. And if you're a parent and you are comparing your child with, with maybe you have four, uh, four children and three of them are good and one is not good and you're comparing and picking up on them, then you are destroying them. So that's why I'm saying the insights you're sharing is relevant. It is relevant because people are going to watch and be like, oh, I'm actually listening to a story from somebody who is actually experiencing dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, and all that. So please go ahead and really share as much as you can to help our, our mm -hmm. audience as well for them to, to understand. Let me ask you, if you were to say certain things to the teacher who, who taught you, in a sense of coming back to Africa, bringing it into Africa, and saying that if you happen to school here, or even schooling in England, what do you want the teacher to know about you? And what support can your teacher really give you that you, you think that would have helped change everything? Um, 
it's that's a bit difficult because here i mean in the uk now i think education system they're taught to pick up these things the signs of dyslexia and the signs of you know children that may have phdsd i think it's called or autism you know learning difficulties especially from you know the things they do so with here i think they do a good job of picking up i mean they even pick it up with adults like myself so imagine but i think in africa um well there's people like you that are creating the awareness i think the awareness needs to be improved then especially within the schools you know from early age because um i believe that in africa a lot of children might have or do have dyslexia and you know teachers and the parents are unaware and sometimes they're unaware because they don't know about it. and also the stigmas that come with being a slow learner is like they just don't believe that it exists like these learning difficulties exist i think a lot of africans don't even want to believe that they're there because with a physical ability you can't disregard it because you see it if somebody's walking funny or somebody can't speak at all or if somebody was born without a limb that's you you know that's recognizable you can see it you know but with a learning difficulty it's it, it's a new it's a neurological thing. it's in the brain it comes from the brain so you know they just don't want to accept it and it's all about creating awareness um you know now in africa a lot of people are creating awareness on mental health autism you know and i think and even yeah autism mental health i mean loads of things even different diseases of cancers and you know all these kind like now africa are really opening up to these things that are opening in the that are happening in the western world now people from the from africa that in the diaspora learn about these things and go back to Africa and are creating awareness like yourself. You know, you, you're from Ghana, but you went to live abroad and all these, these things and now back to Ghana and you're on this mission to improve the awareness of dyslexia. But I think that it's not just about speaking about it on social media or speaking to other people, but going into the schools and doing the work, you know, going into the schools and creating the awareness, like going to different, schools and this is what I do I you know I have an organization about dyslexia and I want to come and speak to you guys about the signs you know and how to know if someone has dyslexia or how to you know know if someone has a learning difficulty because some children are naughty and bad especially in Africa you know especially in children they have the mouth in it they how do you say they're peninsim so the ones that have the big characters but when they come to the classroom, they don't want to learn. But when they're outside in the playground, they're, they're, they're the popular ones. And they're the ones, you know, those that have the learning difficulties. Those are the ones that need to, you know, have. And, but everything, it all boils down to money as well, you know. So it would be if the government would acknowledge, I think the governments in Africa, but we're from Ghana, like the government, would acknowledge that you know these are some of the things that people are going through and maybe put money you know a minister would one day take some sort of action and help people like you you know just to further you know create awareness of dyslexia because I think it's very big in Africa I think a lot of people have dyslexia like a lot a lot of people you know yeah it's because um, it is estimated one in every five is mm -hmm. probably dyslexic. And when yeah. you take in percentage wise of population, you're estimating between 15 to 20% of every population being dyslexic. And so, like you were saying, the students who are so loud outside, I was one of them. Yeah. But then when it comes to the classroom, oh my goodness, I want to hide in the classroom. And yeah. people were always. Oh, up. the teachers were always insulting and and saying oh yeah look when you're outside or you're going for a sketch you're so loud but when it comes to academic work mm -hmm. then you are so silent and they didn't know 
but they do it so so in a very mean way that it really brings yeah. your self esteem now and for me you are sharing about your confidence level i have the, i have the same even now that i mean of course i've gone through school um, i have a good career and everything mm -hmm. but still at the back of my mind I still feel I'm not good. I still feel I'm that yeah. dumb. They, they classified mm -hmm. before just because those were the worst as a child growing up. I was hearing it constantly from both my yeah. friends, school, my parents, that you're wasting resources and all that. So viewers, be mindful of the things. I always say to people, when you don't even know what to do in a situation like this, the only thing you have to do is to show love the child is stupid don't tell anybody they are dumb because they cannot perform academically to your suitability it's it doesn't work it also comes like in africa here the one size of learning there is one method of teaching everybody and you have in class exactly. maybe students <laughs> about 40 60 and you're using one style of teaching them if you were listening to Eva before, she learns through practicals by seeing pictures mm -hmm. and stuff. So imagine if Eva is in your class and you have been teaching and just sitting down and reading from the book and expecting somebody like her to pick. No, she won't. And she will yeah, come last in But would you say or that... If you use the worst part of teaching them, Sorry, <laughs> I was, I'm trying. I'm trying to share our. Ch I'm trying to share our chat on my laptop on yeah. Facebook. So, <laughs> so you say that a child like Eva is not brilliant? No, I feel like you, the teacher, or you, the parents, you are the issue here because it's you that is teaching this child with one star of teaching and not really asking and finding out and being like my child or my student. What can I really do for you to enjoy learning? These are questions I was never asked, and I'm sure Eva was never asked those questions. That is why we grew up and still struggling, and at the age of 30, before we got to know that, um, that we are dyslexic and we have dyspraxia and dyscalculia and all that. If you're watching this, the best you can do is to share this, because as you're sharing, you're not promoting my show. You, you're helping to create awareness. You're helping for this message to get to somebody. You're helping to save someone. We are losing a lot of talent. And if viewers, you don't know, a lot of people in prison are people that have issues. When you trace back people that had issues with learning difficulties. Why am yeah. I saying a lot of people in prison? Because, for example, when I was 13, I was teased so much one day in school. And when I finished, my parents sent me to go to the pipe and fetch some water. And when I went there, my classmates were still teasing me because there was this exams and I had zero. They teased me so much that I took the buckets and hit somebody with it. I was 13. She got cut. She hits me, I got caught, I have. I still have the mark on me. But this is the thing in it. Imagine if I was, let's like, say, 18. I did this to the girl, she fell, she died. What would have happened? Straight, they would take me to prison. If you worry your child so much and they go out and get into bad companies and it's over, you, you don't have control over it again, what happened to them? They will go and do something bad they will go to prison that is the reason why the report states that there is a lot of people with this learning difficulties in our prisons that is why some people say people in the prison are so smart it is the reason why so let's be very very mindful and miss eva i don't know what you can add to it because for me i am so so passionate about this that I could have been destroyed. There are people who I went to school with, we were in the same bracket because I wasn't the only one who was a non-performer. But some of them, when you ask about them today, you hear that, oh, she's in a village, she has about seven children, no life for her. Oh, this guy is 
a maid in the trotter or something like that. And it saddens me. And that is the reason why I'm on this journey. I don't know what you have to say to parents, for parents to really calm down and stop those things by comparing their children with all kinds of children that really don't know the level of support their parents are giving them at home. Um, well, I'm a mother myself, so because I have this learning difficulty, I, you know, I've stuck, like watched my children study them, and they're both very different. Like my son is very academic, but my daughter's like myself. So, you know, where you see that, that might have, you know, you, I think I don't know how to explain. Let me think. Like, it's important to every different so it's important to you know your but if you have more than one child they're not going to be the same like you mentioned and if you do notice that child is you know not interested in studying or they're reluctant to study you know you ask them why you sit them down and you say you know what is the problem is it that you don't understand or is it that you don't like it or what is it like speak to your child because if you speak to your child like a friend they will open up to you no matter how you know young they are or old they are, even if they're not five or if you just speak to them like a friend and ask them what's going on, you know, why is it that they don't like school? Or why don't you know why do they find it difficult to do maths? Because you know in Africa, maths is a big thing. Maths is so important and writing as well. You know, once you ask them, you know, if you like I said, if you talk to them like a friend, they'll open up to you. And then that's the beginning of you know finding out and then also like somebody said as well you need the psychologist to overcome the fear seeing the psychologist will help but the problem is is that in Africa we don't in Ghana we don't have a lot of psychologists and even if we do it's for a certain class of people you know it's for it's for the rich so what about the children in the the, the local schools and you know what about those type of children because Africa is a different ball game to the diaspora the diaspora we're all equal the poor person the rich person we can all go and get assessments done there's funding available you know you get things you get aids put in place once you if a school knows you're dyslexic you're you're entitled to free things and extra time and you know all the things i was saying before but in africa it's it's a different ball game so like i was going i was saying before it's up to the government to um to put things in place in the education system, to make it compulsory, you know, and and put aids in place for assessments for young children. Because if not, then it's it's never going to be the same. You just be going round and round in circles where Africa is concerned with this whole dyslexia, um, you know, condition with having dyslexia. But as a parent. If you see that something, the thing is, what you're asking is that if a parent notices that something is wrong with their child, where are they going in the first place in Africa? You know, that is the question. Where are you going? Even if a mother notices that their child is slow in learning, where is she going to go to get the help? This is the question. You know, where are they going to go? Maybe a lot of parents in Ghana, Nigeria, wherever in Africa know that their child has a problem, but where are they gonna go to get the help is the question. Do you understand? So it, 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 it creating awareness is important, is very important, but putting things in place, you know, to, for people to get help is another question, is another issue, you know. It is true. You, because you, you're on that journey, you know how it is, you're creating the awareness, but not, you, you may not be getting the funding to make things available. I'm sure if you had a, the money, you'd open assessment centres in every village <laughs> or every town, you know, or at least in predominant areas in Accra where people can come and pay. Like, mon it can be affordable for them to have an assessment. But then you have to also pay the psychologist who's coming to do the assessment. And where are the psychologists in Africa? Where are the psychologists in Ghana? So. But it's when you think about it on a deep level it's you know we have a lot to do
we have we have a lot to do when it comes to dyslexic awareness in Africa. But the good thing is that it started. There's people like you. There's a lot of other people like you said that you've had on your show that you're connecting with. That you know, but this is the the you have to get to the root of the the problem, the grassroots, and that's where the problem is. Is that even though somebody in Ghana might see that their child is slow, or whatever, where are they gonna go? Who are they gonna talk to? Yeah, you are absolutely right. And uh, so that's why I, I initially started with awareness, but I realized that aware just awareness is not enough. So then mm. need to add advocacy and then have a plan of support. What can we yes. do with people who will be diagnosed or who come out as having learning difficulties? And so one of our work is really going to focus on having conversations with the people in policy making. Um, so you're looking at the Ministry of Education, the Ghana Education Service, and really letting them know. But I have to let you know that they are doing something. I, if okay. I am not, I still remember, because I've been in hospitality and all that, I still remember the challenges people with quotes in quotes, disabilities, so various forms of disabilities, physical disabilities, the challenges they had in this country yeah. where the blind, the deaf, those the CPs and all that, what the support is for them. But it's changing. Mm -hmm. um, today they are yeah. recognized, they're giving the support they need. Um, it's not enough, but we are somewhere. And I still yeah. see it in uh, inclusive education policy where it was actually captured, learning difficulties was captured. However, oh, okay. attention wasn't given to it. Attention wasn't given to it as we would expect. So this is the time we need to kind of engage them and really tell them that it is needed. It is important you recognize it. You have to set up budget allocation to really put yeah. in resources to help these people. We need to train our teachers in this country. That's we need the, the passionate ones who will do assessments at really yeah. reasonable fees. Because some of them are in the market now and you are in Ghana, but you have to pay probably about $800, $700 to, to do an assessment. The minimum I have so far, it's about 550 Ghana cities. And you have to even ask yourself, how many people are able to afford a hundred dollar assessment in Ghana? Exactly. So there's a lot that needs to be done. And um, we just started. We will see how far we can go with it. But um, with all the support anybody can assist, please, this is not one man show. We all need everybody on board to really yeah. make it happen. But I also have to mm -hmm. give a shout out Alexia Ghana, they have been in the system for the past 15 years and really have helped some wow. children. Families consider that these children are good for nothing. But some of those students today are in Australia, US, some are in Ghana here, doing really, really good. And so when you give the right intervention and support to a child that is not performing, it will shock you what will come out. This leads me to a question by... Laurie here, she is asking, uh, the child who okay. talks and behaves like adults, is that a problem or is due to socialization? Um, the child who behaves like an adult, I don't know, I wish you could have added, is the child good at school? And if not, and the child is behaving as adults, what are the examples? Because for all you know, this child has really good confidence somebody who can really mm. engage. Try looking at the positive side than the negative side. Because if you're saying she behaves like an adult, that means, I'm thinking that means confidence. And in Ghana, yeah. of course, the child who has a lot of confidence is giving the mm. name tag of we are Kalabone, you are behaving like an adult and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and so if that child has that confidence, find out what is she confidence in so that you can nature that whilst also helping her to perform well in school. Uh, I will take some few comments and see. 
Okay, so Ellen is saying you are really talking about the perfect or failure culture we have here in West Africa. And I think that is to you. What is sad is that nothing has changed. The understanding of learning and support for the students is really low. Yeah, and I know Ellen is from England, but she has been living in Ghana for a, for very long years over here, many years. Uh, oh, okay. over here. Okay. She is an educator, education consultant, okay. and her passion is to make sure like we really have resources for people with learning difficulties. Uh, otherwise, Ghana is losing a lot of stars. So, okay. Okay, the problem is the number of qualified staff to do assessments. Yes, I agree yeah. with you. We have a lot of them here. And that was what Miss Ava was saying that really get people who are qualified to do assessments. And so one of the things we are looking at is engaging the Ghana Psychology Association to see how they'll be able to kind of inform people to be aware about this and see those who are really yeah. passionate and want to take extra courses to be able to do assessments uh, for students. Miss Eva, we're still on you, but we'll be yeah. ending very soon. Yeah. What are mm -hmm. your natural superpowers? Um, I like, like I said, I'm a practical learner, that's one. And two, I'm a people's person. I'm very sociable, so. I noticed that from a very young age, I'm I'm able to bring different types of people from all walks of life together. And that's like my superpower. It's like, it's something that even now I'm able to do effort, effortlessly. Like I'm not afraid to contact people. I'm not afraid to reach out to somebody for something. And I don't know what it is. It's like, if I talk to someone about something or if I reach out to somebody, I. It's like I can get them on board to do something. And um, that's why I went into PR some years ago. And when I was younger, like I said, I wanted to be a lawyer because I always, I'm good at representing people and I'm good at, you know, helping others. I'm really good at doing that. I'm really, I was always good at helping others. Help. So that's something that I'm really, really good at. So that's yeah that's my super super power but uh, and also i am very i'm a very good problem solver so i'm very good Thanks. at solving pro problems and organizations that's what you know in my workplace I've, people have noticed and you know people that i work with colleagues know that i'm very good at problem solving and some people are not good at that. It's, it's not everyone that can do that. But if you give me any situation, I can work it out, out definitely. So I'm a change agent. I'm a good change agent as well for, in terms of business, a lot of people have come to me with their business and asked how they could, you know, change things or rebrand, you know, or how they can communicate better with their audience or their consumers. And, you know, I'm good at things like that. So I just focus on the positives. I'm not so good administrative stuff. But, you know, in life, we're not good at everything. So I just see uh, if I'm not good at certain things, you know, people pay people to do things now. You shouldn't let anything stop you from reaching your goals as a dyslexic person. There's always a way around things, you know. Even a normal person has a PA. Yeah. A normal person has an accountant, a normal person. I think sometimes us dyslexics, we we overthink things as well. And, you know, we think because maybe we can't do certain things, that's the end all and, you know, that's it. But, I mean, not everybody can do everything. That's how I see it. So I'm, just, I'm normal. In my eyes, I'm normal. Right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And seek for the help if you need the help. Uh, I would yeah, say that. Help. I mean, yeah, even in, sorry, sorry to cut you, but like even in Africa, you know, like I said, there's people out there with dyslexia. They are, the, they're probably the smartest people. They're the ones that know how to make money. They're street hustlers. You know, they, you know, they know how to bring people together, do things. So, 
I think even if there's no money, it's not always about money or, you know, it's always just about asking for help. You can ask your, I have a friend who is extremely, extremely like, she's doing extremely well and she's dyslexic because she asks her friends to do things for her. You know, she even asks people to read her emails for her. She's not afraid to ask anybody to do anything for her. And because of that, she's doing extremely well here because she's just not afraid to ask. So I think that should be the mindset of dyslexics, people with dyspraxia, people who think they might have dyslexia. You know, you should just know that you're not the only one. And there's there's a lot of here struggling it's a daily thing. It's it's a daily battle, but you just have to keep persevering. I absolutely agree. You just have to keep persevering. But if you have a child and the person is really young, this year we having as adult conversation on dyslexia, dyspraxia. But for children, early intervention mm -hmm. works. If she received yeah. the proper interventions when she was really young, I'm sure what she would have become is more than what she's doing now. But it's because the support wasn't there. Nobody really identified her. I always say I'm living my, like very, the very limit of my, my ability. I could be so many things because my mind works in a very weird way. But because I didn't find myself in the right environment to enable my thinking ability, who would have Imagine maybe it's something I could have done, done doing hospitality. I love hospitality. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying that because I didn't receive the right support at the right time, I still have never received any support. And so is ever as well. So, but then we persevered and we are here today. How many people can do that? Because the journey is really hard. But for a child who is yeah. in your school, for a young child that is at your heart, in your home, you can make a change in that person's life. Help us to keep creating awareness. Help us, invite us to places to come and speak. And I have to say a shout out to uh, Lako of, of Ago TV. She has been phenomenal. She's online watching us now. She has been so phenomenal, giving us her platform to, to talk about dyslexia, to share information. When you go on this TV, which is a tree program, and you speak, and the calls that come in, people identify wow. the story. People know what you're talking about the moment you're speaking, because you're speaking from a practical view by like you sharing your story. If she invites you to mm -hmm. sit there and share it, that is how our parents are able to identify and yeah. say that my child is like that. I've had a 65 year old woman called me and said, I am myself what you are describing. You just described my life for me just by watching me. And so, Lako, thank you so much mm -hmm. for doing an awesome work with mm -hmm. your media your outfit. Thank you so much. And wish others also can be like that. What would be your parting words for parents, for teachers, for the general public, people who are watching now and people who are going to be watching later? Um, like I said, like I said before, if you notice, you know, your child is different from an early age, you know, sit them down, speak to them, ask them why. If you see that they're struggling with school or struggling with academics, especially because academics is what we need in life to go anywhere. You know, whether we even we need academics for life, for life in general, we need basic math skills basic reading and writing skills. We need all this just for life as, as much as going into the professional field. So when you notice that your child is different or struggles in these areas, you should sit them down and speak to them about it and ask them like a friend would sit down and ask a friend, why, you know, is it that you don't like going to school? Is it that when it's time to learn, you find it hard to concentrate? You know, just speak to your child and find out because that's the only way you're going to find out you know what the problem is or get to the root of the problem but like you said in Ghana it's very difficult and the lady said before you know you guys are working on it I mean our system here is different the teachers they notice when a child is different 
or having learning difficulties within the classroom, they, they pick up these things quite early now. You know, it's not a big, it's not so much of a big deal in the day. Well, it is, but it's not, like I said, it's part of the curriculum to pick up these things. It's normal. But in Africa, I think we just need to, you know, look more at our children and focus more on our children. No matter how much of a businesswoman or businessman that you are, you have to go up and get to work. You know, you have to you have to focus on your children and you have to see because a lot of children that become promiscuous at early ages as well, that's a sign that like, you know, going into promiscuity and and you know, doing bad things like you're talking about the prisons earlier. You know, when you go into the prisons, you find out a lot of prisoners are dyslexic. It's like that in the UK as well. It's not that they're bad or they wanted to do what they did, but, you know, they just didn't have no way out. They didn't believe in themselves. So they just decided, OK, let me focus on being bad or let me do what, you know, whatever. So it's important to know who your child is from a young age and you know when they start picking up from the ages of like three and four when they start learning the alphabets and learn how to count and stuff like that that's when you really need to be watching them um, also if they're finding it difficult to write you know that's uh, uh, that's a sign of dyslexia if they don't know how to write from like the age of four or five finding it if, like they they can do everything else, but they don't want to write. That's that's this that's an early sign of dyslexia as well. So it's just, I mean, that's all I can say because I'm not a professional. Like I'm the one with dyslexia. I'm the one with dyspraxia. So I can only speak about having the experience. But um, I think it's just common sense, really, to watch your child and be more of a parent. That's what parenting is about. You know, watching how your child develops very important and sometimes in Ghana they like to say oh he's like this or he's slow and, you know even like a child walking that's another sign as well like some children walk really late you know like I was I remember when I was young I was in Ghana and there was a child that was like 18 months still not walking and the parent was just saying oh that's how their dad was their dad, you know those kind of things they don't take things seriously but how can an 18 month old child not be walking? Like, <laughs> wrong, you know? So it's just like, but I think, like, I think things are changing in Ghana in terms of education, but it's all, it's all about, you know, the government helping, it's get, getting funding. It boils down to, get, it really, really, really boils down to having psychology assessments because if there's no psychologist there, how can the assessments be done? You can't assess when you're not qualified to assess or to, you know, I may not give diagnosis. You can't, because I can identify if I go to Ghana and go to schools with you, I would be able to say, this one has dyslexia, this one, but I'm not, I don't, I'm, you know, I don't have the qualification to say that. I don't have no right to say somebody has dyslexia from my own personal judgment because you can't. We can't just go around saying this person has a learning difficulty. They have to be diagnosed. Exactly. Uh, and I, I totally agree. I always tell people, because um, when you go on radios and TVs, after speaking, people call you and be like, oh, my child also have dyslexia. Then I will have you have assessment done to determine if they have um, dyslexia. But one thing that recently was a very great conversation Ms. Joy and I have, which is the founder of Dyslexia Ghana. And we were like, if we should, the testing, the assessment is so expensive. 550 Ghana cities is really expensive. Fine. We probably may see the signs in students that are is saying that uh -huh. they may be uh, experiencing learning difficulties. I think the way to change things it's rather the style of teaching, the style of teaching in our schools most of the times so that it can benefit all children. There has been a studies that have shown that the way to teach a dyslexic child, the same way can be used to teach a normal student and they are fine, they will even be superstars, like super, super great. But then it's not the other way around where you use the method of teaching the 
the, the, the normal students with somebody having learning difficulties. So yes, let's refrain from saying your child is dyslexic just by hearing us talk about some of the indicators that will tell you that your child may be. If you have the means, please do contact Africa Dyslexia Organization or Dyslexia Ghana. Have assessment done so that you can use those reports to go to the schools and really get them to give the right support to your children. We here, we're doing our best and hopefully in few years to come, the government will be able to listen and pick that this is necessary and that we didn't need to do something about it. But until then, we'll keep our work on advocacy and awareness and hopefully soon mm -hmm. we will have maybe the resources to give you the assistance you need. There are a few comments here that I would like to go in before uh, we leave here. A few of somebody saying, a few of psychologists are around. The problem is how to pay them. I must say there are resource teachers in our basic school who are ready to help. Continuous professional development should be worked out for teachers. And I absolutely agree with you, Nicholas. I absolutely agree with you. And I think, Nicholas, I saw another question. No, that is Laurie. Laurie asks, how can she get in touch um, to continue the discussion? And so, Laurie, you can contact Africa Dyslexia Organization. Uh, if you want to be in touch with Miss uh, New Love as well on Instagram, and that's her Instagram handle, Miss New Love, that is showing there. Just on the same page you are watching the thing, send us a message on, uh, on, on in our inbox or visit our website, africadyslexia.org and get in touch with us. I have all my contacts over there and you can reach out to us. Share this as much as you can share. And Miss Laurie, if you don't know, we are having a training for all viewers. We are having a training on Friday and Saturday. It's going to be very exciting. We have four, five facilitators who are well experienced in the subject matter. who are going to take you through our first speaker is taking us through all the learning difficulties, including okay. ADHD as well. And so please don't miss up. We currently have over 600 people registered. That is how serious wow. it is. 600, 600 people, over 600 people registered. I know people are hungry for content. People are hungry to know. And for me, it gives me joy that people are gravitating towards something like this. Because the moment they get the information, that means three other people are going to hear about it. And the awareness will keep spreading. So the information is on our page. Everybody, if you haven't signed up, please sign up. Do join the, any of the WhatsApp groups as well, just to stay updated with when we are going live and everything. We'll be very happy to, to, to engage with you. And if you know any media houses, call us. We would love to go and speak on it. Churches, invite us. We'll come. Your schools, invite us. And we'll come and engage with you as well. I have to say a very big thank you to Miss New Love for coming wow. to share her story. Because it's not everybody who is bold in sharing their story. In Ghana here, parents who even know their children are dyslexic are running away from it because of stigmatization. Because people yeah. think all the learning difficulties is related to a disease or an illness. No, it has nothing to do with any of them. It's just a learning difference. Your child has a learning difficulty. That child in your school may have a learning difficulty. They are not sick. Their mind is intact. They are super intelligent. So please don't shy away. And that's why I'm super grateful for New Love for just being that bold to share her struggles, to share to you that I struggle to read. I struggle to compose my emails. I struggle on my daily tasks. It doesn't change who she is. It's just that she's empowering all of you. And I hope you take some a thing or two from this. We really thank you for staying with us. Um, we are here. 
next week as well but don't forget the training because if you miss this training i don't know when we're gonna bring you mm -hmm. such top-notch content again so thank you all for joining us tonight bye thank you for having me